Good morning, everybody. This is the first colloquia of the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia for this uh, New Year 2021. And the first talk will be given by Professor Dr. Juan Garcia Bellido uh, from CSIC Madrid. And he will talk about the primordial black holes, dark matter, and gravitational waves. Isabel Marquez uh, will introduce uh, Professor Garcia-Berito. Hello, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for attending the first uh, web locum in 2021. I, I take this opportunity to wish you a happy new year, um, and I really, I really hope it will be happy and will be new. Of course, I thank uh, Professor Garcia-Berito for accepting our invitation to contribute to the uh, online colloquia in our Severo Ochoa program at the My Instituto pleasure. de Astrofisica de Andalucía. Um, an invitation that I would like to extend to a real one uh, for the next future expected one. Our, our invited speaker, Juan Garcia Bellido, is professor of theoretical physics at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and researcher at the Instituto de Física Teórica from the Spanish National Research Council, or CSIC. He got his degree in physical sciences from the Universidad Complutense uh, in Madrid in, in 1988. Then the doctorate in physics in the, by the Universidad Autónoma in, in 92, with a thesis work done at the Instituto de Estructura de la Materia, so it makes a sick. Afterwards, he got two postdocs, two years each, first at Stanford University in the United States and then at the University of Sussex in the, in the United Kingdom. He was also fellow and research associate of the theory division of the CERN, where he's still regularly uh, invited. He also enjoyed a Royal Society University Research Fellowship at Imperial College uh, of London and who was guest professor at the University of Geneva during a sabbatical year. Author of uh, several uh, hundreds of papers in specialized journals, uh, he's an international recognized theoretical cosmologist. Member of the Dark Energy Service, uh, Save Collaboration DES, and also the Physics of the Dark Universe POW, and also a member of the consortia from the ESA missions, Euclid and Blisa. His research covers a wide range of phenomena from the origin of the universe in terms of the theory of co cosmological inflation to gravitational waves, the formation of galaxies and the nature of dark matter and energy. He told us he's a lover of music and painting and he's married and has two children. It's a pleasure, it's a real pleasure and an, an honor to have today with us Professor Juan Garcia Bellido talking about primordial black holes, gravitational well, waves, and dark matter. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you so well. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you, and a Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for the invitation. It, I definitely we accept this invitation to be in person in a few months when, when this pandemia has finished. And I hope uh, by then we will have uh, new results that would make this uh, even more interesting. So I'm going to uh, tell you about a new paradigm, a shift in paradigm in terms of uh, the formation of structure in the universe. And this is based on fundamental physics, as you will see. The idea is that primordial black holes may constitute all of the dark matter. And uh, fortunately, we have now the means to test this idea, uh, which has been with us for a few decades, uh, thanks to the uh, new window that has opened to us. Uh, in the universe, which is uh, the detection of gravitational waves with, uh, with interferometers like LIGO and Virgo. So I will try to be a very broad. I will try to give you an introduction to the subject, a uh, very uh, gradual introduction. And uh, at the end, of course, I, I'll be happy to answer any, any specific question that you may have from the scenario itself. So first of all, uh, all of these would not have happened if we weren't on the shoulders of giants. What do I mean by that? We have to uh, we base our understanding of the universe into uh, three or four fundamental pillars of understanding in, in physics. The uh, gravitational physics from general relativity, uh, thermodynamics, and the microscopic uh, behavior of matter from quantum mechanics. We also know uh, the structure of the universe in terms of their fundamental constituents, uh, what are, we understand as uh, particle physics, uh, the standard model of particle physics, in terms of the uh, particles we, we know and love, the uh, leptons and, and uh, 
uh, hadrons, uh, fermions, and, and bosons, no? which uh, constitute the, the elementary uh, constituents of, of the universe. Now, in order to understand the beginning of the universe, we uh, understand now in, in terms of uh, an idea, the, uh, or, or a paradigm, the paradigm of inflation, which uses two fundamental concepts, that of general relativity and quantum mechanics, to convey, a com a first give rise to the tremendous expansion of, of the universe at the beginning, and then to a seeding a, a structure a, on, on space-time, creating the seeds onto which eventually all the galaxies and the structure we observe in our universe they form. Now, this general picture is a very uh, dynamical one. It started uh, near the Planck scale with this tremendous expansion that we call inflation. It ended generating the Big Bang. So it produced all the particles, the relativistic particles, which then expanded, uh, driving the, the expansion of the universe and uh, later on evolving forming structure. So first the first nuclei, then the first atoms, first, first stars, galaxies, etc. until uh, we observe it today. So all this evolution, it comes from very fundamental uh, physics, uh, which happens at very high energies. And uh, for the moment, we don't understand, or we don't know what is the fundamental constituent giving rise to inflation. We believe it's an effective description in terms of a, of a scalar field, which uh, we call the inflaton, whose quantum fluctuations uh, produce ripples in space-time, which are stretched by this tremendous expansion and become classical cosmological fluctuations. An instance of which can be seen in the uh, cosmic macro background anisotropies that you are depicted here. So in the sphere of the sky, we observe the remnants of those fluctuations during inflation as little differences in temperature in different directions in the sky that we call temperature anisotropies. Now, of course, inflation is not just the generator of fluctuations in the CMB. It generates fluctuations on all scales. Typically, we are accustomed to observing the fluctuations in both a CMB scale, so the larger scales in the observable universe today, or in large structure scales, all the way down to megaparsec scales, you know, where galaxies, clusters, and superclusters leave. And these fluctuations, which we observe, eh, actually correspond to a fluctuation that left inflation, were generated in the early universe at a specific scale, a specific time. Inflation does one-to-one -one correspondence between time and scale. So it tells you that, say, fluctuations that left 50 or 60 efforts before the end of inflation entered relatively recently in the universe, eh, in our observable universe, say, forming superstructures all the way to the horizon. Now, scales that left much later than these, so near the end of inflation, say 20 to 30 efforts only before the end of inflation, or all the way to 40 efforts, actually enter in previous times, in what in, in astronomy are early universe phenomena, but in a cosmology is a, in the radiation era after the, the end of inflation, under, after the reheating of the universe. And these happen at a specific times, a specific times when new phenomena occur, in particular when, for instance, the electroweak transition occur, or the QCD transition, or later on, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis at the formation of the first elements. So all of these scales are not accessible to direct experimentation with, with uh, say, galaxy clusters, with very tiny scales which already have gone through nonlinear evolution. And therefore, we cannot have access to what, is, what was the fluctuations during inflation that generated the structure of those scales. However, if, and this is a big if, uh, there are features in the uh, dynamics during inflation which give rise to large amplitude fluctuations, this could give rise to a collapse of uh, those fluctuations to form black holes that then will give a signature that we can then observe in, in our universe. And I claim that this new uh, scenario, what we call the primordial black hole scenario, could give rise to observable features. And therefore, by looking what happens today on those scales, right, we can then extrapolate back to the early universe and understand what happened in the early universe that gave rise to these fluctuations. So we are opening up with a, a new window into the early universe, which goes uh, back to the first instances 
thanks to uh, this new scenario of uh, primordial holes. Now, what are the actual observations that we have? And for this, we need another two big branches of physics, general relativity and thermodynamics, and understand the origin of gravitational collapse. You're all familiar, very familiar with the notion of radiation pressure and collapse because that's the way the stars evolve, no? So let's imagine that we have a large concentration of matter in a particular point in space, and this matter trends to a compressed due to the action of gravity. And there are two possibilities, either gravity wins or radiation wins. If gravity wins, there is nothing to oppose compression and contraction all the way down to the formation of a black hole. This is known since the Penrose uh, theorems in the 60s, which uh, happily have received uh, recognition with the Nobel Prize a few months ago. And this collapse to form black holes, it's an inevitable phenomenon that happens whenever you have fluctuations above a certain threshold. So this happens in the, in the universe. This is not something which uh, we, we can ignore. Now, there is the possibility that radiation, as this gas compresses, radiation uh, pressure prevents the total uh, compression down to a point. And there is part of this mass which, through this radiation pressure, bounces off and produces an explosion. This is known as the supernova explosion. And through conservation of linear momentum, would give rise in the center to the collapse of a black hole. So you could have black holes formed after an explosion where part of the matter has been dispersed in the supernova explosion or direct collapse in the early universe. Now, the first line would give rise to these primordial black holes. The second line would give rise to the stellar black holes. So if you want, in a pictorial way, you can follow the collapse of a, a supernova by this rapid compression which uh, leaves at the center uh, a rotating gas through conservation of angular momentum, mm, a very tiny fluctuation will generate through the Ballerini effect, the conservation of uh, angular momentum, an object which is rapidly rotating. If it happens to form a black hole, this black hole would be naturally very rapidly rotating. Now, <clears throat> on the contrary, in the early universe, when a fluctuation is sufficiently large that can overcome radiation pressure, and radiation pressure comes from the usual relativistic particles that are moving in the plasma at extremely high speeds. So this plasma prevents collapse, except if the gradient of curvature is so large that not even radiation pressure can prevent collapse. And then you form a primordial black hole. And for this to happen, you need a large amplitude of fluctuations. Now we know that inflation seeds those fluctuations, so it's natural to expect that in certain locations, very isolated locations in the universe, those few regions where you have large uh, curvature fluctuations might collapse to form black holes. But there's something very interesting that happens in those, since most of the mass within the horizon in those primordial black holes collapse to form a black hole, there's very little compression. The size of a black hole, the short radius of a black hole is that of the horizon, essentially. There's an efficiency factor of order one. Then there is no uh, spinning effect. The universe is perfectly isotropic at that moment, and therefore black holes, primordial black holes, are expected to arise without spin. And that's for the same mass, okay, same shorter radius, that's just radically different from what you would expect from the stellar black holes. It's because stellar black holes, you have a compression of a huge amount of gas down to this very tiny region. And by this, by conservation of angular momentum, and by this reduction in radius, means that you have, you have in, printed a tremendously large uh, angular momentum, or, or sorry, not angular momentum, but uh, angular velocity. So the object ends up being rapidly rotating. And this is what we observe, for instance, in BD super uh, pulsars, hmm? compressed objects, which are the remnants of supernova explosions with uh, rapid, uh, rapidly spinning. Now, how could these arise? How does, could inflation arise again from in the early universe, do we have a, a picture where inflation can be based on uh, the known physics that we have from particle physics? And he, here's where critical Higgs inflation comes to the rescue. Again, this is based on two basic uh, um, pillars of physics, quantum mechanics and the standard model. And there's something very interesting about the standard model, and that is that as we have recently discovered at LHC, is that there is a scalar field in the standard model called Higgs, 
the Higgs gives rise to the inertia of particles through its coupling to all particles, fundamental particles of the universe, both bosons and, and fermions. And it has its own potential, its own self-coupling, quantum self-coupling. But it may have, and this is the issue which uh, was exploded for critical Higgs inflation, it may have a non-minimal coupling to gravity. Normally, we assume that the scalar field that drives uh, or gives inertia, the Higgs field, uh, it's in, essentially in flat space when we do experiments at LHC, and therefore we're not sensitive to this side coupling that you see here hmm, in red. But there could be a non-minimal coupling to gravity. It's a dimensionless coupling, and just like lambda, the self-coupling of the, of the Higgs, they both run with scale under renunciation group equations, and as well as uh, the self-coupling of the Higgs, the quartic self-coupling may decrease to zero, hmm, sorry, at some point at high energies because of the actual fundamental uh, couplings of the standard model. The same happens with the nominal coupling to gravity. They, it has a specific running with scale. And we can work out what is the behavior of the early universe in the context of these nonminimal couplings and self-couplings of the Higgs. Again, the Higgs of the uh, standard model. Now, if you go back to the early universe and evolve this, this gives a dynamical uh, energy for the Higgs, which drives inflation. This dynamical energy has the form of an effective potential that has this shape. It has a little plateau here, and it goes to a, another plateau at large values of the field. Those fluctuations that left, and we can compute through the evolution of this inflaton, sorry, you can compute what is the amplitude of the fluctuations that left some certain efforts uh, before the end of inflation. Remember this one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, time and scale during inflation. Now, those that correspond to the CMB scales, fluctuations that uh, correspond to uh, the CMB, left 65 efforts before the end, and they correspond to this flat plateau. So we can look at the uh, consistency of Higgs inflation with the CMB fluctuation. Now, it's very interesting because without touching anything about the standard model, the actual couplings of the Higgs to all the particles give rise to a special feature in its own dynamics, which gives rise to the little plateau. This little plateau produces a large peak in the fluctuation, which has this shape. On Planckian scales, it's perfectly consistent with the observations, all the way to wave numbers of order 100 or so. That those that we are probing by large structure, but on smaller scales, beyond 10 to the eighth yeah, inverse megaparsecs, so we're talking about scales below a parsec, so very deep inside yeah, the potential, it gives rise to a very high amplitude of fluctuations of order 10 to the minus two in curvature. Now, these fluctuations could give rise to enough a probability of collapse. So a very few domains would collapse to form black holes. Now, the dynamics that give rise to the collapse is that that I was describing before, radiation pressure opposing gradients of curvature. Those gradients of curvature, as long as they are sufficiently large, will give rise to collapse. Now, these fluctuations have a certain distribution. And whether the distribution has a, a specific a, a statistics, whether it's Gaussian or non-Gaussian, you will have a higher probability or not of gravitational collapse. So it all depends on the specific dynamics during inflation, how quantum fluctuations during inflation behave to give rise to, through back reaction, on fluctuations on the uh, special hypersurfaces that later on, as they re-enter the horizon, produce the collapse to form black holes. So depending on whether the fluctuations are Gaussian or non, whether you have high tail city distribution, that is, rare events are more probable than in a Gaussian, then you could have the probability of collapse, which comes from the integral over a, a certain threshold for collapse all the way to infinity of these distribution functions. If these are highly non-Gaussian with high exponential tails, you could have, for instance, cash code statistics, and therefore unsuppressed uh, high tails, and therefore larger amplitude of collapse. If this happens, then we have, again, a one-to-one -one correspondence between scale and e folds number of e folds before the end inflation, therefore between scale and mass of those black holes. Because all of the mass within the horizon would collapse, according to Penrose, and we can evaluate what is the size of the uh, horizon at that time, and therefore what is this, the mass within the horizon at that time. 
And that gives you a correspondence to the number of EFOs. So 36 EFOs before the end of inflation, you will produce black holes upon uh, re-entry of the order of 30 solar masses. EFOs, sorry, fluctuation that left less EFOs before the end of inflation would give rise to a smaller black hole. Fluctuation that left much later would give rise to larger black holes. And therefore, we have a, a, this correspondence between mass and a, a scale during inflation. Moreover, how do these fluctuations, uh, why are they non-Gaussian? And this has to do with a very uh, detailed behavior of those fluctuations, which is quantum mechanical, okay, during inflation. This has to do with what's called the stochastic delta N formalism. I won't go into details because this is a colloquium uh, like a, a description. However, let me very briefly uh, um, uh, describe this in terms of Fokker-Planck diffusion equation, which gives rise upon solution to high uh, exponential tails okay, of this uh, probability of collapse. And therefore, given the dynamics during inflation, this uh, quasi-inflection point, you would give rise to larger amplitude of fluctuation than expected otherwise. Okay? Certainly much more than expected, say, in the CMB. Moreover, given that you have very non-Gaussian fluctuations, that means that if you ask what is the prob probability that another black hole would collapse at a given distance, the correlation function, the analogous to the correlation function of galaxies on, on logical structure, the correlation function of finding another uh, black hole nearby is modified with respect to a Gaussian and therefore makes it much more probable that those black holes are actually forming clusters. So they do not form uniformly distributed because of this Gaussian, non-Gaussian diffusion, but actually they form forming clusters. So the, actually we could do uh, N-body simulations and follow how those clusters evolve. We see that they form uh, pairs yeah, after a uh, recombination in the matter era. They form pairs which break up because of three-body interactions. So they are very dense clusters. Here there's a photo of 3,000 black holes in those clusters, which is a typical number for, for the, uh, those simulations. And we observe how those pairs form and, and disrupt. Moreover, we can see, we go to the next uh, simulation, we can see some cases in which, depending on, on the density of those clusters, many of these just simply uh, evaporate. They, they are blown up. Some of these move up. Let me go back again to the, to the simulation and look at one of these which form a pair and this pair leaves the, uh, the cluster. So it leaves the cluster in, in a bounded system. So it's no longer affected by the other black holes in the cluster which break up here, okay, the, their, uh, in their two body. Uh, so these objects are left, okay, the, uh, the clusters forming binaries. They're very rare and they're not so many, but still there are some. And they will play a role, as I will describe, for the observation of gravitational waves from uh, those pairs. So that means that rather than having the usual constraints on primordial black holes that have populated the literature for the last 40 years, hmm, where essentially there is no single window for those black holes to live eh, eh, in eh, having all of them the same mass, what is called a monochromatic spectrum. Now, in the case of a primordial black holes from inflation in the stochastic uh, quantum diffusion scenario, you would expect to have a broad mass distribution and a cluster distribution. That means that rather than being uniform distribution, these black holes form clusters, and therefore, in the case, for instance, of the constraints from microlensing, the Eros, Macho, and Ogle collaborations, which would prevent black holes from having, say, about 10 to uh, say 0.1 solar masses, here they are allowed to be there because the amount of uh, black holes which are in the halo for our galaxy, which would be between us and the light of a star, would be suppressed because most of them are forming halos of say 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses. And therefore, large fraction of the matter in the halo is forming clusters rather than a uh, uniformly distributed smaller black holes. And all of these completely uh, eliminates those constraints. And in particular, they leave, eh, for the white mass distribution, they leave a hole mm, around 10 or so solar masses, where you one could have a, a white mass distributed with, and clustered distribution of black holes, so especially a mass distributed, mm, different from the uniform uh, and monochromatic distribution. So the old picture 
of monochromatic uniformly distributed is recognizably completely ruled out. And actually, it has been ruled out for more than a decade. It's the broad mass range and a cluster a prime order black holes scenario, which still remains, the one that we proposed in 2015. So this is scenario is the one that I uh, insist will give rise to the phenomena that we observe on logical structure, as well as the gravitational wave phenomena. But in order to understand what's the actual mass distribution, so how are those black holes distributed in mass, we have to use, again, the uh, two pillars of physics, thermodynamics, and the particle content of the universe. And for this, we have to understand the thermal history of the universe. How does the number of relativistic degrees of freedom, the radiation pressure in the early plasma, evolve as the universe cools down? When the universe expands, certain, the temperature of the universe drops below certain mass thresholds, the masses of particles, fundamental particles, like the Higgs, eh, like the top quark mass, like the W and the C. When those mass thresholds are reached and the universe cools down below, those particles become non relativistic, as we know. And therefore, the radiation pressure associated with this plasma drops. This gives rise to a little decrement in the equation of state of the plasma. But the most dramatic decrement in the equation of state comes when quarks and gluons, which were relativistic, condense to form hadrons and mesons. This happens at around the QCD transition, more or less when the universe had 200 MeV or say um, 10 microseconds old. And when this happens, the universe uh, has a tremendous drop in the radiation pressure. The equation of state drops to 0.2 or so. This means that what was previously impossible to form because of radiation pressure, a much smaller amplitude now can uh, collapse to form black hole. That means that we have through the successive decrements in the equation of state, we have a way, eh? and here we have the correspondence to the uh, E plus E minus annihilation much later on at say MeV scales, no? when the universe was much bigger, it had a horizon which comprised a mass of about 10 to the five for solar masses. So this gives rise to a mass spectrum that you see here on the right, which has a very pronounced peak because of the QCD transition at 200 MeV, which corresponds to what I call the proton peak, proton antiproton peak, when those uh, particles formed and became non relativistic as they form immediately in the moment uh, as they form. And later on, when the pions annihilated, uh, what we call the uh, pion plateau, and much later on, when E plus and minus annihilated, to form peaks in the structure in the mass of these primordial black holes, which could give rise to 10 to the minus 5, few hundred, and 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes. Now, this comprise most, here is the fraction of the energy density in uh, dark matter made out of primordial black holes. This could comprise essentially all of the dark matter. The integral in mass over this function gives you one. So you could have 70% in the form of a primordial black holes of a few solar masses, two solar masses. A few one in a thousand of black holes in the form of 10 to the six solar masses. This could act as seeds for structure formation. This could act for the first black holes, which then accrete gas, form accretion disks, and grow up to become supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies at redshift 100, okay, much before you would have expected from the usual uh, natural structure evolution, which doesn't have enough time to form those black holes so early. These you would have seeded the formation of structure by these black holes, or you could form planetary black holes. Mm -hmm. Maybe those that have been observed by Ogle in, in uh, Andromeda or possibly uh, Planet 9. So 10 to the minus 5 solar masses, Neptunian size, um, um, planetary size black holes, which could affect the orbits of transmitterian object, objects. Now, I will concentrate on this, which is where most of the dark matter would be in this scenario. And surprisingly, it has a mass which is similar to that of uh, the Sun. How come? Well, this is very interesting. In the case of the sun, we know that stars have uh, that kind of masses because of uh, the uh, Pauli exclusion prism. They cannot be smaller because a neutron electron degeneracy prevents uh, the compression beyond uh, the, there is a degeneracy pressure due to the Pauli exclusion principle. And you cannot compress a mass uh, beyond that scale. And therefore, you, you can have at most typically a solar mass object, which would go through thermonuclear reactions and remain stable for hundreds or, or, or even thousands of millions of years. Mm -hmm. 
Now, a similar mass comes, remember the Chandrasekhar mass is the ratio of two fundamental scales, the Planck mass, a 10 to minus five grams cube, over the proton mass, the square. This gives you the solar mass. Same happens, but for completely different reasons, okay, for because of causality, at the QCD scale, or around the proton mass, because this tells you what is the mass within the horizon. So again, here, the mass of the, uh, within the horizon, given that the density of radiation at the time, times the volume of that horizon, the distance to the horizon cube, which goes, again, depends obviously on the uh, Newton's constant, therefore the Planck mass, and it gets goes the Planck cube over the um, QCD scale of the proton mass squared. And this gives you, not surprisingly, a mass which is similar to that of stars. So it's not surprising that promotable holes and stars have similar masses. There's a fundamental physics behind it. It's a cubic uh, um, power of uh, the Planck mass over the proton mass square. Now, how does this affect galaxy formation? As I was describing, those initial seeds would create the necessary uh, initial conditions for structure to form. In fact, if those clusters have typically 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 solar masses, they will form the building blocks over which you start forming all those halos of galaxies. Obviously, the head of our galaxy is formed out of many of these uh, clusters. So we're talking about millions or hundreds of millions of these clusters, all the way to 10 to the 12 solar masses. And these, this means that we are in the fluid regime of the head of our galaxy. So we're not looking at the corpuscular uh, character of these uh, halos. We never reach 10 to the 3 solar masses as anybody simulations, as you all know. Typically, we reach 10 to the 9 solar masses in cosmos simulations. And if you have hydrodynamical simulations, you can go down even to 10 to the 6 or so. But we never reach 10 to the 3, which is the corpuscular nature of these uh, promotable whole clusters. So in that sense, there is no difference in cold dark matter uh, with respect to primordial whole dark matter. Mm -hmm. They are collisionless. They are uh, cold, obviously, they don't interact with each other, and they behave exactly on large scales, like a color map. It's only on small scale, this is the small scale large scale structure, which are, we are beginning to test with uh, galaxy surveys, like the dark Energy survey in the future with Euclid and with the LSST. Those small scale structures, and with uh, gravitational lensing, of course, should begin to be uh, observed uh, if this scenario is correct. So that, th that is a prediction for, from this scenario. Okay, so only on small scales, as I said, we should see differences. But remember that uh, this scenario uh, is, is very different on small scales because, let me make this analogy, which in a colloquium-like style is, is uh, more appropriate here. Imagine the particle dark matter scenario, which is analogous to the Thompson model of the atom, like being uniformly distributed in a given volume, where you have stars in the halo of our galaxy which are moving within this uh, halo of particles. If, uh, if the dark matter is made out of particles. Obviously, uh, the motion of these stars is insensitive to the uh, existence of these uh, particles. Mm -hmm. Only on very large scales, you see rotation curves. Mm -hmm. But locally, all those uh, stars are only moving because they see the potential induced by the other stars in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They don't see the particles. Now, in the Rutherford model, for most of the stars, this is exactly the same. You don't see the behavior, the, the distribution of mass, rather than being uniformly distributed, it's concentrated on a compact object right at the center of this volume. And this is where the primordial black hole lies. And therefore, when a, most of the stars around in this volume would not feel the presence of this black hole, except for a few stars, which have very close encounters with the primordial black hole and may change a, its linear momentum, may be link shot away through interactions with this primordial black hole, very similar to the alpha particles in the Rutherford model. So if you have a compact object, you may have very rapid exchange or, or strong exchange of linear momentum and have a slingshot. So you, those stars may be thrown out of the halo. And if these halos are uh, shallow, for instance, in very uh, ultra uh, faint dwarf galaxies, the potential well is very shallow and uh, you have very little mass, those stars are moving in these potential wells. If the dark matter in those halos, and remember dwarf spheroidals have very large mass to light ratio, so you have huge amount of uh, dark matter this compared to stars, maybe a factor of a thousand even, those stars would be moving in a dense halo of black holes. And therefore, it's very probable that one of those stars would be uh, thrown out of these uh, halos. They would be snatched off. If you want, the velocities, induced velocities through the interaction are larger than the scale velocity, and they leave the, the, the halo of the dwarf. And maybe this is the reason why they became faint 
maybe they lost stars. A search for hypervelocity stars in the hill of our galaxy coming from uh, Sagittarius, we published recently, could, give, uh, could, could be the reason hmm, behind those hypervelocity stars seen in the Gaia catalogs. But that's a matter of a discussion, if you want, for uh, after the colloquium. Moreover, if those black holes are actually seeds for structure, and we know that there is a, a very interesting relationship between the typical velocity or the dispersion right, motion of a stars in the inner parts of any object of all masses, on all halos, right, all the way from dwarfs all the way to a uh, huge uh, super galaxies at a high redshift, which, uh, whose black holes at the centers have been measured, hmm? you see that there is a relationship between the mass of the black hole at the center of uh, all galaxies and the typical velocity of the gas in the, in the bulge of, of, those, of those galaxies. Now, it's interesting because uh, our claim is that these are populated because primordial black holes were at the center and started to uh, grow by accretion of the gas and therefore uh, it created all the way uh, to supermassive black holes. But it's not just supermassive, it's all the way to very small scales. So uh, these lines that you see here in purple and blue is the prediction from our model. We see that we can explain the otherwise unexpected correlation between the mass of the black hole at the center of those galaxies and the mass in the SFRL, the inner part. And we can evaluate this through uh, the halo mass function and compare with the actual observations. And we see that except on large scales, where this would grow through accretion, and we, we did not include this in this curve, through accretion, you could explain the, the actual relation between the mass of the black hole at the center and the mass of the galaxy and the inner part of the galaxy. Moreover, we have microlensing events, and you're all familiar with microlensing. I will go slightly uh, faster here, otherwise I won't finish on, on time. The, it depends very much on the mass of the deflector, but it depends also on the distance of the object. Typical distance of the deflector for objects, so stars that are in the LMC is a few tens of kiloparsecs, but uh, luckily, uh, recent detections, as I would describe, uh, have measured nearby objects, nearby uh, lensers. Mm -hmm. So remember that the Einstein ring depends on both the, the mass of the deflector and the distance of the object. And for a typical masses of, say, 100 solar masses, you need a average uh, half crossing of several years. So therefore, you need very long surveys of microlensing uh, events, which have not been taken care of, uh, taking, uh, at least yet. Uh, they are going through very long duration microlensing service at the moment, but typically those that have put most of the constraints uh, were cut off at around a few solar masses, up to 10 solar masses, because of this inability to follow very long duration events. Now, recently, Ogul, which has been monitoring the light of stars in the bulge, uh, in particular in certain di direction where there are uh, plenty of stars, millions of stars in, in, this, in this direction, where they could follow for long enough that they would uh, span several years. And of course, through several years, the motion of the Earth around the Sun would induce a, a parallax effect on the amplification of the light of the star uh, at a distance of a few kiloparsecs. So what you observe is the usual Pachinsky curve of the amplification of light due to a microlensing event, modulated with the motion of the Earth around the Sun. These oscillations happen every time you go through from June to December again because of this motion of the Earth around the Sun with respect to the direction of, uh, of the star. And this modulation breaks the degeneracy between mass and distance. That means that we can now determine what is the mass of the deflector. And this is how uh, Visikovsky and company from the Olga collaboration 2016 determined that there were objects of order tens of solar masses in the halo of our galaxy. Moreover, by using Gaia together with Iliamanda, they were able to determine the distribution of masses. And they found, interestingly enough, that not only were there non-trivial uh, large mass objects, but there were also black holes, which they, they were, remember from this uh, graph, they were seen at relatively uh, short distances, few kiloparsecs. With the resolution of Gaia of magnitude 18, an object at a few kiloparsecs would be seen. Uh, if it were a star. 
So a start of a few solar masses at the distance of a kiloparsec could not be undetected by Gaia, which has magnitude 18 sensitivity. And therefore, they are very dark objects. The most natural explanation that they are black holes. Now, even for very small mass black holes, you would have seen with Gaia, okay, with that magnitude limit, you would have seen those objects. And therefore, it's natural to, to see that the distribution of masses of black holes around the solar mass which have, among others, between two and five solar masses. There's a very clear peak of mass gap. I will go into mass gap in black holes in a minute. But not only this, but also below solar mass, black holes. Whether these are primordial black holes or not is still under question. We have not seen them with gravitational waves. Let's, let's see what is the next step. And the next step is to compare those distribution uh, in mass with our prediction from uh, the early universe, from the uh, proton peak and the pi and plateau. You see, we predict that there is a certain fraction of the mass uh, in the halo, which should be in black holes of around a solar mass. And indeed, this is where most of these uh, observations from Ogle and uh, Gaia are. But the clear cut would come from gravitational wave signatures, because it's the cleanest way to measure the mass of a black hole. Thanks to the fact that we can follow the in spiral all the way to the end and to the innermost stable circular orbit and determine the mass of the companions with high fidelity or below 10% in some cases, we can tell whether these uh, black holes, uh, what is the distribution, the precise distribution of masses of these black holes. Now, it's important here that there are two ways, uh, two limits on our sensitivity from Lyg and Virgo. One has to do with the seismic wall below say 20 Hertz, which we are prevented from going below. Simply, this would create vibrations in the mirror, which would prevent you from being sensitive to very massive black holes. Remember this goes like one over the mass. So if we have say 100 solar mass black holes <coughs> or, or 200 solar mass black holes, this would give you uh, values which are, uh, so the final physical frequency, which are below 20 Hertz and therefore undetected by light over there. And moreover, if they're very light, again, you would have a, here masses, which a few solar masses, which would enter the a final innermost stable, stable circular orbit, which enter into the realm where a, the laser power hitting the mirror would make it vibrate. This is called the quantum shot noise. Individual photos hitting the mirror makes it vibrate above kilohertz. And there, that means that we cannot see a, events which come from the coalescence of below solar mass black holes, okay? They are deep inside the, the, the noise. So we have this range between one and 200 uh, solar masses. Now, fortunately, the uh, LIGO Virgo detectors have been detecting in the last uh, few years uh, over 100 of these uh, events, 50 of which have been uh, published. Out of these 50 events, each one is a binary, therefore we're talking about two black holes per event. So we have of the order of 100 black holes. And it's interesting that all those black holes lie in a range of masses between 10 and 160 solar masses. And this is quite amazing. So we're probing masses which were much beyond those expected from the usual stellar black holes produced from supernova explosions, which have been observed through X-rays. And what we call here, the, or LIGO calls here, the electromagnetic black holes those that lie between five and 20 solar masses. These are significantly above those. Moreover, there is a region between two and five which were not expected. This was some prejudice. Perhaps there is no fundamental reason why there shouldn't be black holes between two and five. Now, LIGO has definitely, LIGO Virgo has definitely observed objects which have black holes, which have face mass. But there is a, a region between 50 and 120, 130 solar mass, which was very well established, should not contain black holes. Those black holes should not be there, and they haven't been observed by LIGO. And this has to do with what's called pair instability supernovae, certain evolutionary stages of uh, very massive uh, stars, which they, uh, as they compress, they start producing, uh, they have energy above the threshold of uh, pair producing electrons and positrons, and these uh, do not provide sufficient pressure they take away photons from it, so photons converting to E plus and minus, and this means that radiation pressure decreases, more compression happens, and this is a runaway process which obliterates the star, it doesn't leave any remnant. 
So you wouldn't expect to have black holes there, period. Now, those black holes have been observed by Ligo Virgo. There is a lot of a speculation whether other astrophysical phenomena could produce them. For us, the most natural interpretation is that that's not surprising. They precisely correspond to where they should be, which is the uh, pi and plateau. That means that by opening up the sensitivity in, in LIGO Virgo between one and a, and 100 or 200 solar masses, we are beginning to populate the mass curve from our scenario. You see that not only do we have ogle events around the peak, but we also have significant amount of events, about 40 or so solar masses, and a few that reach 90 solar masses, which we claim are primordial. Of course, this is not just the mass. We have to ask about the rate of events. Do they agree with what we'd expect? And for this is crucial to understand that those events that LIGO and Virgo observed come from binaries that were formed very dense in clusters. So they had a high probability of formation of the binary and then three body interactions moved away the full center of mass, all of the binary left. And therefore, rather than breaking up the binary, they just simply made the binary leave the, uh, the cluster and eventually merge far away from the cluster. Now, this gives you a large rate of events, something that we could uh, evaluate with the sensitivity of the uh, first run one and two from LIGO Virgo, what is called the uh, gravitational wave transient capital of one, which lie essentially where our model predicted. And this, we made the prediction before the, the final catalog. But moreover, we had a prediction also before 2019, before the catalog got published 2020, so in, in September 2020, of where should all those black holes in run three, the GWTC2 uh, catalog uh, appeared, where all of those black holes should be. And there are three islands. There's an island at very high masses, corresponding to the pi and plateau, where uh, the mass ratio is 4 to 1. Mm? The deviation from this diagonal to the left is mass ratio. Mm? So uh, that means that you can have large masses, mm? and they are consistent with uh, being primordial, according to this scenario. There are a few here which are uh, separate from here. Perhaps these are stellar. They are around 10 to 15, 20 solar masses. So perhaps there are two populations within the LIGO Virgo uh, black holes. Most of them are primordial, but there are a few that are stellar. This is my claim. And there are, and this is a new and interesting result, uh, events which are very large mass ratios, 0.1, like this one. And there are some in run three, which uh, is not depicted here, and I am, uh, that I'm aware of, which is near this island. But more, most interestingly, there are, because of the sensitivity of uh, run three, which uh, was deeper and therefore extended further into low masses, one could begin to see the low mass uh, fraction. And this is where a few events have already appeared in the run uh, 3A. Run 3B will be published soon. Uh, the catalog would be uh, incremented by another factor of 50 or so. So we uh, predict that there should be more events here and here, as well as here. Okay, <clears throat> so rate, mass, what about spin? Remember, spin was one of those a quantity that gave a clue whether uh, the black hole arrives from the stellar evolution or primordial. Now, a, a specific prediction of the uh, primordial black hole scenario is that those initial black holes, unless they have already merged, they would be spinless. If they were formed inside these clusters and they encounter each other and left the cluster and finally merged, then they should have no spin in the initial configuration. Now, the spin of a black hole when it merges, uh, imagine that you have this binary with different spins in different directions compared to the angular momentum of the binary, you can compute the projection of these spins onto the angular momentum of the binary and make a weighted average, uh, what is called the chi effective. Now, this chi effective can be measured very accurately with the uh, waveforms of from LIGO Virgo of these spirals, and therefore one can uh, determine this sky effective and surprisingly of all the events except a few and I'll describe later why which have essentially all com uh, concentrated around zero which could be due to the fact that they have zero spin but it's not just the effective uh, spin chi effective this projection but moreover if you have two spins and uh, two, two black holes and these black holes do not have spin they will inherit because of a um, frame dragging 
if you want, the motion of these two black holes as they merge and form the final black hole, the final black hole will inherit the rotation from the motion, from the angular momentum of the system. And there's a very specific prediction for internal relativity. If your initial black hole had zero spin, the final black hole spin should be 0.686. And this is precisely where all of those final spins cluster. So we claim, and we made an analysis with all of the GWTC2 uh, black holes, we observed that to 90% confidence level, all of those uh, spins are, the, the magnitude of the spins is below 0.2%. And this happens, either they are isotropic, aligned, or anti-aligned, it doesn't really matter. Once you consider both the uh, run one, run two, and run three A, we find that all those black holes, the bulk of it, is essentially spinless. So, what's the future? The future is we have now running uh, the two LIGO uh, interferometers, the vertical interferometers, and the Kagra, we just started operations, and in run four will be fully operational. Then there is the prospect for uh, creating LIGO India. This should be in 2024 to 2025 operational. And we will have, therefore, five uh, interferometers in place, helping us determine the location of the source and very accurately the masses. But clearly, in order to uh, reach very low masses and convince ourselves that there are a primordial black holes below a solar mass, where the Chandra second limit would not have prevented them, these black holes should be seen with uh, beyond the seismic uh, wall. And for this, we need a third generation uh, gravitational wave detectors. We need a ISEN telescope, LISA, Cosmic Explorer. The ISEN, the idea of ISEN telescope is a, an interferometer, just like a LIGO or Virgo, but rather than having two arms, having three arms in an equilateral triangle. And this helps uh, by going underground, reduce the seismic noise, and uh, have a broader uh, frequency range. This will allow us also to reach very high redshifts. Mm -hmm. Ligon Virgo, because of its sensitivity, cannot reach, say, beyond redshift of five or so. So we still are in the realm of possible stellar evolution black holes. Now, if we reach redshift 20 to 100, stars have not formed yet. And therefore, if one observes uh, events at those high redshifts, they are necessarily primordial in nature. Moreover, if we look not only in redshift, but we also look in mass below one solar mass, we see that we can extend uh, the sensitivity of these uh, curves below solar mass, and we see we would be able to reach uh, nearby uh, black holes below a solar mass and very clearly convince ourselves that there are primordial black holes in nature. And other issues, whether those black holes comprise all of the dark matter or not. So <coughs> let me conclude. With this, quantum diffusion inevitably generates primordial black holes because of large fluctuations during uh, inflation. Thermal history through the uh, decrease in the radiation pressure predicts that those primordial black holes will have a multimodal mass distribution. So you would have masses 10 to the minus 5, a few 100 solar masses, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. The spin and mass distributions of those primordial black holes, which were predicted, are perfectly consistent with the LIGO, Virgo, and OGO uh, microlensing uh, results. There are features in those distributions, peak and plateau, which soon will be mapped, and therefore we'll have a convincing evidence that they exist with that mass range. Other peaks could be explored with microlensing, for instance, the 10 to the minus 5 solar masses. We could look to Andromeda or the bulge and search for those uh, very light black holes, which would have much shorter uh, uh, microlensing events. And in general, this primordial black hole scenario could explain many of the uh, cosmic conundra which are today in our uh, cosmological evolution. This would give rise to a paradigm shift in structure formation of the universe. It's no longer particle dark matter, uh, what, what creates structure, but primordial black hole dark matter with very specific predictions onto the small scale structure, which can be probed, as, as I was describing, with both natural structure and microlensing. And this gives a, I've just scratched in this uh, colloquium the surface of a tremendously rich phenomenology, which is multi-scale, multi-epoch, and multi pro And hopefully in the near future, we will have with third generation detectors, both in natural structure okay, and in, in gravitational waves, uh, the, the ways to, to constrain this and, and confirm uh, the scenario of primordial holes. 
And with this, I finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Garcia Bellido. And Thank now you. the talk is open for questions. You can make your question just uh, raising your hand or doing the question in the chat. For raising your hand, please open the participant window. It is in the bottom of your menu. And there you can see a blue hand that you can press and, and uh, raise it up. Uh, and John, I think you, you will manage the questions. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thanks a lot, Juan. It was a great talk. I have to say that I have learned a lot, really. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Then let's, let's see how is, uh, I see some, some hands already from Chema, the first one. Hi. Um, you were turning on the, the video so that I can see your face. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one second. Sure. Let me prepare my head. I didn't brush my head today. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I thought your, head, your hand was there. All sorry right. for that. So thank you, Juan. It was a really, really welcome, very interesting talk. Sure. As you say, this year is going to be exciting. Hopefully, we'll learn more about this uh, really intriguing uh, candidates for that matter. I, I, it's one of my favorite candidates. So one of the things that I noticed that you discussed a little bit, um, but the recent uh, LIGO team doesn't go much into detail, mm -hmm. is the, the mass ratio and the apparent preference <clears throat> for all the, especially the latest detections, yes. for a mass ratio close to one. It seems like a binary black holes like to marry one that is alike. And um, there is one point in this graph which approaches that third island, which is predicted by your model, it's also predicted by the mass function of uh, LIGO, the one they, they, they uh, adopt as their best model. They need to include a new ingredient in their model, which is a probability distribution for this Q. Yeah. Which is a bit strange. They don't explain that much. Um, I can explain a little bit if you want. Okay. And I, I was wondering... Detection if, biases. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I was wondering, you know, one thing I find interesting from your model is this clustering thing. I was yes. wondering if there could be a mechanism like a mass segregation within these clusters mm -hmm. that could explain his apparent preference for Q equal one. Extremely good question, Chema. Okay, so indeed, there are two issues here. One is a, what kind of biases the detection induces on the actual observation of binary. That's first, right, that you pointed out. And the other is what is the dynamics of our scenario, which are specific to the, uh, the actual mass ratio. And let's go first to the uh, detection strategies and, and how uh, LIGO and Virgo uh, tell you that you have a, an event above a certain uh, signal to noise ratio. So they use templates and they use match filtering for the moment. They, they still have not uh, envisioned uh, using neural networks to uh, distinguish the, the waveforms inside the noise hmm, in order to extract the existence of, a, of an event. So for the moment, they, they have to uh, describe those uh, binaries and, and their evolution and their waveforms in, in templates. So they have to generate those templates first. Now, I am aware that there is a very strong bias to uh, using templates because it simply opens a new parameter space. You have to take uh, not only different masses, different spins, uh, different uh, projected spins, you have to introduce a precession. But when you include also very large mass ratios, the effect on the, on the templates exponentially grows. So you have to have many more templates than you would otherwise. You simply have another dimension in parameter space to explore of your template space. Now, there's also another issue, which is a bias in the sensitivity. It has to do with the fact that a Q much less than one, so why we haven't seen so many uh, very small uh, mass ratios, or very few of these have been observed, is because they take a shorter time inside your detector. If you want, the, the little mass ratio induces a much faster, from the moment you start being seeing it above 20 hertz, remember there's a trigger. You start seeing things about 20 hertz, and then you wait until the final merge plunge comes in. Now, this depends very much on the mass ratio. So the mass ratio changes the, uh, the, the time it takes to, to stay inside, and therefore the signal to noise ratio. That means that in order to see an event with high uh, signal to noise, you have 
you, you need it to, to be to have very close to one mass ratios. Very tiny mass ratios are, are too short to, to be distinguished from noise. Okay, so uh, you have a bias towards a larger mass ratio. So I believe that there are more uh, low mass ratios in, in the whole sample. It's just simply that we have to uh, modify our uh, strategy for detection of those uh, deviations. Now, with respect to a uh, mass segregation, extremely interesting. So indeed, I, in, in this uh, latest simulations from uh, June uh, last year, we uh, put into uh, embodied simulations the motion of these dense clusters. And we did observe that those black holes, which were uh, dense, uh, definitely moving in, in this uh, inner regions of the, of the cluster, were very quickly uh, drawn out through slingshot effects. Three body interactions uh, typically tend to evaporate those black holes, which have 10 to the five solar masses at recombination. And when they are start to allow to, to move and, and, and uh, coalesce and, and drive their, their dynamics inside, most of the heaviest would go to the center hmm, through the usual dynamical friction. Some of them will merge. Others simply, the most massive, maybe 10 to the three solar mass, would go to the center. They would orbit around the smaller masses. But the lightest ones, which would have encountered a deeper potential well, massive, more massive ones, would be thrown out, just like I was describing for stars in dwarf spheroidals. So I would expect the evaporation of a, the, the clusters would, to happen first with the lightest ones. So I would say that the most, the, the one solar mass, 0.1 solar mass, or, or below, up to say uh, 10 or so solar masses, would be thrown out of those clusters. So you would remain inside the clusters with the most heavy ones. Now, this, for the, in terms of microlensing, uh, gives you very specific predictions. Mm -hmm. And also for the uh, merger events that you would expect from LIGO and Virgo. Because these that we observe today probably were slingshot away in binaries, as I, we observed in these simulations, during the radiation era. So they were not waiting until the radiation, uh, sorry, matter era to, for these black holes to evaporate. So they could form, say, a binaries of 30, 50, 80 solar masses, okay, way inside, deep in the uh, radiation era. It would take, this by the way, explains why uh, we observe these events at redshift uh, 0.8, which is seven giga uh, years after the Big Bang or half, halfway you know, in the age of the universe. So they, are, they would already found each other in these dense clusters very early on and only much later would merge to, to make the emission of radiation waves detected by LIGO and Virgo. So there is a segregation of mass. There, this gives you an, a, a constant for the, the rate of events that we observe in different mass ranges. And this is part of the reason why we observe this uh, maximum here being of compatible magnitude as this one. So here you have, otherwise remember, we had a high peak, much larger peak at uh, two solar masses than 100 solar masses. These two could not have been, just from mass ratios, would not have been as, as frequent as the other one. However, because of the sensitivity and because of these uh, merger rates that I was describing, this big cancer enhance. It's much more probable to have these black holes uh, with these masses. So there's a lot of dynamics involved in this plot, which uh, reflects what was the evolution in the early universe, radiation and matter, that gives rise to these rates. So it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial uh, connection. And it's surprising that it agrees so well with, with observation from light and vertical. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so there is a question by David Bals Gabo. Ah, oh, David, happy yeah. new year. Nice to see you. Hi, Juan. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. It was absolutely thank fascinating. Thank you, David. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is how dependent is this prediction on the shape of the inflaton potential? Or alternatively, if you get the mass spectrum, how constraining will that be for you know, single field inflation? Because the constraints from Planck are very loose. And so this is, this is the Excellent. first question. The second question is that I worry that this will produce actually a behavior similar to warm dark matter in the sense that it will erase power on small scales, right? Well, it depends how small you go. I, I, I will go, okay, let, let me describe, uh, uh, respond to the both. Uh, for the first one, I will jump directly to the transparency, this one. 
It's an excellent question, David. So indeed, uh, the dynamics of inflation has a, a direct consequence on the power spectrum of fluctuations, but not only on the power spectrum, the two-point function, but also in the full PDF distribution. Remember, there are high tails you know, of the distribution, which give an enhanced pro a probability of collapse. Now, on, on very large scales, so on Planckian, uh, the scales of 10 to the minus four, uh, inverse megaparsecs, uh, to a uh, logical structure scales, uh, Lyman alpha clouds, mm -hmm. overall those scales, uh, this corresponds to the upper part of the potential. If you want, they correspond to these scales. Okay? And this uh, very simple lambda 5 fourth uh, model for the Higgs with a non minimal coupling gives you a flat plateau there. So this is like a Stravinsky model of inflation. There's no difference. It's easy to tune there. And, and as you say, uh, the constraints from Planck are quite loose. You could have a, a spectral tilt of 0.96, a, a ratio of tensor to scalar of 0.03. Or three per mil. That's okay. That, that's not. That's not an issue. Now it's very interesting that the dynamics, uh, which have to do with the inflection point, and this is crucial, that it is the, the Higgs, because we do know through realization group equation that the self-coupling of the Higgs decreases. This is due to the fact that the top quark is very massive, and the, the loops in the in the correction quantum quantum field theory correction to the uh, self-coupling of the Higgs comes through loops of top quarks, which contribute with a negative sign, minus the mass of the top to the fourth power. And this drives the self-coupling down at high scales. So if, as we move to, from electroweak scales to Planckian scales, so we go to say 10 to a 15 GV where inflation happens, all those self-coupling decreases, has a minimum, and then rises up again. And it's this minimum gives, gives rise to this feature in the potential. So it's a very specific prediction of standard model of particle physics. Mm -hmm. Now, can we change the, uh, the shape of the plateau? Yes, if you change slightly the coefficients and the, and the running of those couplings all the way to high scales, high energy scales, we will change the position of this peak. This could be here or here. So you could change this, you could change slightly the inclination, if you want, the tilt of the second plateau. So if you see, there's a universal feature here because of this uh, inflection point in the middle between 60 e folds and zero, around 30 or so, 40 e folds, you have two plateaus, the plateau corresponding to the large scales and plateau corresponding to the small scales. This is 10 to the minus nine, a few 10 to the minus nine in, in amplitude. By the way, this should be the square root of power spectrum. This is a uh, typo here. And this should be, a, as I say, 10 to the minus, no, 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 it's okay. It's a power spectrum, there's no square root, otherwise it would have been 10 to the minus five, beg your pardon. So these two plateaus have diff very different amplitudes, but similar tilts. Now, this determines, when we go to the, to the mass distribution here, which is what you were asking, this determines the change in the tilt determines the relative abundance of one peak with respect to the others. For instance, if the secondary peak or plateau, which appears at small scales, has a tilt which is 0.98 instead of a 0.97 or 0.96 instead of 0.97, we observe that the peak, the relative uh, fraction of say 10 to 6 solar masses compared to two solar masses differs, maybe almost by a factor of 10, 5. So there is a specific prediction uh, which would give rise to very tiny changes in the tilt of those uh, of those fluctuations during inflation. It would change again at 10 to the minus five solar masses. How many uh, microlensing events should I see with, with Opel towards the uh, Andromeda or with whatever microlensing survey that we, I want to use to detect this peak? So I think there's a, here a tremendous opportunity to use the observations that we have in terms of mass and transfer this to the early universe because the only ingredient that we are using here is fundamental physics that is well tested. And in this, I want to make an analogy. Uh, the Big Bang nuclear synthesis was described for the first time by Gamow and their collaborators in the 40s of the last century by extrapolating nuclear reactions that were recently uh, analyzed and measured with high accuracy in reactors in the 40s and 30s okay, to the early universe. Now, we're, what we're doing here is going a step further. Rather than, say, energies of order mega electron volt, the typical nuclear reaction energies, which would give rise to effects on the nuclear reaction rates in the early universe, giving rise to the light element abundance, lithium, helium, deuterium, etc. What I'm doing here is using fundamental particle physics, high energy particle physics uh, measurements, no? the analog to the nuclear reaction rates that have been observed in accelerators, 
100 GV to several TV. And then extrapolating this physics, which is well understood from the fundamental point of view, all the way to the early universe and asking, what would that give rise to if there were a plateau of fluctuations from inflation? Well, it would give rise to these features. So by using fundamental physics, which is well tested, and having the ingredients from a quantum fluctuation to inflation, I can use my mass spectrum of black holes to know about the early universe physics. So in that sense, I think this is a, a tremendous uh, window into the early universe. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to uh, what you were asking about the, the, the masses and the small scales, the small scales, of course, you would be sensitive to uh, all this slingshot effect, but you would be sensitive also to the distribution of uh, and the abundance of faint dwarf spheroidals. Now, of course, those that we observe at the moment around uh, our galaxy and other galaxies, uh, since they are so faint, and you know this very well because of your uh, Picasso uh, proposal, uh, you want to, to see objects uh, orbiting around uh, these halos of, of galaxies, which are as faint as possible, because you would then be probing the substructure that form very early on hmm, and successively accumulate around larger halos forming the, all the galaxies that we observe. So if we could follow those uh, dwarf spheroidals, we could follow them as a function of redshift in, in evolution. We could tell what is their constituents, how much dark matter was there before, how many of those stars which were there originally have been slingshot away. Now those black hole clusters, which uh, we were discussing before, have segregated between most massive in the core and the least massive, which move out in the halo. These will give a specific signature onto how those, uh, those stars are slim shot away. And in particular, it would give information on something which we uh, sent recently to the archive, and I guess you're familiar with, which are tidal streams. So what we're interested in is, what is the behavior of these pockets of primordial black hole clusters which move in the halo of our galaxy and from time to time interact uh, gravitationally of course with tidal streams you can use tidal streams if you want as a, a target for these black hole clusters as as they move leave gaps in the tidal streams so by looking at the distribution of gaps or the distribution of fluctuations in the tidal streams one could be able to infer the distribution of masses of those black hole clusters. And this recently with uh, Francesco Montanari, we sent to, to Muffin Notices, it's not yet uh, accepted, a paper where we claim one could, through tidal strains, be able to look at the small scale structure in our halos. And this would differ very strongly from a usual particle dark matter um, uh, large scale structure or small scale large scale structure. Mm -hmm. Because unless you have action, for instance, with mini clusters at 10 to the minus 10 solar masses or so, most of the uh, dark matter would condense on scales which are well below the resolution scale of both uh, the tidal streams or the gravitational density. So here you have, again, a new realm of uh, observations which could be probed uh, with, with, the, with the future surveys. So how is this small scale the logical structure uh, of orbiters around uh, our galaxy and other galaxies uh, behave. What is their dynamical uh, motion and how do they uh, affect the tidal streams and any other substructure? How in general would they affect the, 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 the structure and the, and the profiles, the density profiles inside those uh, galaxies? So with respect to density profiles, that was not your question, but I can answer because uh, the difference with Back to particle dark matter is, as we know from the usual Navarro and White uh, and, and other profiles, is that they typically cusp towards the center because the small particles, since they have very little cross sections, they can concentrate around the potential well, so they can go to the center mm, and concentrate there. Now, in the case of black holes, that doesn't happen because black holes, those in clusters or in in, in the uh, evaporated from those clusters in the halo, they will have a, a minimum size, so they will scatter off each other. They are compact sources. They're like billiard balls, right, really. So you would have at the center of, of a galaxy a, a black hole, just like you see in this distribution. So this would be a supermassive black hole. This black hole would have a halos of a, this a black hole clusters orbiting around. Some would disgrade, some would break up. And these black holes, as they orbit around, they hit each other. That means that they leave a hole 
the distribution of dark matter in the center of all halos have the form of a delta function, a supermassive black hole, and a distribution which rises to the maximum and then decreases like one over n squared in density. So instead of being a cuspy or a nasty profile or thermal, which is a flat core, actually decreases towards the, the center. You have less dark matter inside. It's like as we observed, there are less stars in near the center of, of our galaxy. These black holes behave in a similar way. They are being moved around and, and, and leave a hole at the center of these halos. So we have a specific prediction for the density profile of not just our galaxy, but other uh, smaller galaxies, which should have this, this shape with a maximum at intermediate scales. And this, interestingly enough, has been observed uh, recently in some dwarf asteroids. So I think there's, as I said, I was just scratching in my lecture the, uh, the tremendously rich phenomenology in electrical structure and in particle physics that uh, arises from this scenario. But this is one aspect. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Juan. Okay. We have two, uh, two other questions. One is from Almudena Prieta, I think. Almudena, are you there? No. Then I don't see her. Yeah, it was in the in the chat. Okay. Okay, and then uh, Nacho Trujillo, Nacho. Hello. Hello Nacho. Um, hi, Juan. Uh, very nice talk. Everybody has said. So I had two questions. The very first one was already answered. By, I mean, was um, raised by David. So I'm not going to ask the same. So my second question is: When you say that the primordial black hole. Um, can change the paradigm of dark matter, you're assuming that the amount of dark matter in the primordial black hole is enough to fully rule out the scenario of dark matter as also particles? Or for example, can you make any kind of prediction that uh, you know, the total amount of dark matter is in, in the form of primordial black hole? Or do we have any room for having extra dark matter in other, let's say, components like particles? Excellent question, again. So uh, indeed, uh, this scenario gives you a mechanism for generating those uh, primordial black holes, which naturally constitute dark matter. They're collisionless, <coughs> and they, they dilute like matter. Now, uh, that doesn't preclude the existence of particle dark matter. It only means that you would have to share a certain fraction with it. Now, uh, the issue of whether these black holes that have been observed by LIGO actually comprise all of the dark matter, it's not resolved. Okay, for the moment, we don't know, <coughs> sorry, whether uh, this is 100% or only 70% of all of the dark matter. Now, it, it is true that like we have different components uh, of radiation, neutrinos, photons, and so on, and they don't, they're not so different. There are about 100 um, species per, per cubic centimeter. Uh, same thing could happen with uh, dark matter. They could be comprised of, of different components with similar abundances and all evolving, uh, diluting with the volume. Now, uh, it is true that eventually we should know because uh, the rate of events that we observe in LIGO and the actual abundance of uh, dark matter in the halo of our galaxies should be measured with uh, eventually with microlensing surveys and with these uh, tidal streams and other small scale structure probes. So I claim that within a decade or so, with a tremendous enhancement in our sensitivity on small scales to probe both in gravitational lensing and a uh, dynamic of motions uh, in the halos of our galaxies and, and in clusters of galaxies, we should be able to, to see uh, these structures. So we should be able to see the, the clusters of black holes and, and evaluate how abundant they are abundance and masses and, uh, and therefore rates of events. So there will be a moment where the, the information from many different sites, you know, uh, in light from microlensing surveys, in radio from uh, um, the, their effect on, on, on the uh, radiation that comes from molecular clouds, which also hide black holes, by the way, primordial black holes, in, in x-rays from and gammas from the gas that falls onto onto these black holes both in the early universe before recombination giving rise to a spectral distortion of the cmb something which i didn't mention and it's another signature okay, which would give you an independent uh, liver arm on the abundance so we, we should know uh, according to their uh, spectral distortions okay, 
how big are those spectral distortions since they were there before recombination, the inevitably they would inject energy into the plasma and therefore modify the high tails, the high frequency tails of the, of the CMB uh, Planckian spectrum. So by looking at different, many different angles, this is why I said this was a multi-scale, multi-epoch, multi-probe um, problem, we should be able to finally uh, decide whether it is 100% of all the dark matter or not. Another issue is what happens with dark matter around these black holes. If they are there, uh, dark matter tends to uh, condense around uh, those black holes. So once we are convinced that they are there, for instance, imagine that we, uh, in, in the near future, we detect below solar mass black holes. They cannot be stellar because of the uh, Pauli exclusion principle or Chandrasekhar mass limit. And therefore we confirm that they are primordial. That means that they were there. Uh, before recombination, and they should have acted as uh, aggregates of gas. So they should have added, they should have uh, grown, or they should have uh, also uh, moved in, in the mass spectrum, and they uh, also would have uh, gained a, a contribution. Hmm? <coughs> Gamma and all. You know, so we would have, a, a, it would also a capture a dark matter. It would eat up part of the dark matter. In, in, in the form of, of particles. So there, there, is a, there, is, there are several avenues by which uh, we, we might reach the conclusion that those black holes are all of the dark matter. Um, the, the concluding aspect, I would say, the, the, being really conclusive, it would mean that uh, we, we rule out a, a, any sensible candidates of particle dark matter from, say, axions, uh, fuzzy, um, WIMPs, etc. by direct observation mm, through uh, other experiment, experiments, or uh, we end up filling up the whole uh, um, contribution of primordial black holes to the total. So either case, uh, we, we should know what fraction of all that matter will be in black holes. And as, okay. as we correctly say, we don't yet know. Okay, thank we you. Haven't Okay, I, I think uh, there was uh, another question by Chema. Chema, if it, if it is a short one, go ahead. In other case. I thanks. My question will be short, but I'm not sure Juan's answer will be short. <laughs> Probably not. Mm. So, well, I was told that I could go on forever, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really, following the advice. Really quick. Uh, if I understood correctly, these uh, intermediate mass black holes, they would um, be the no, they yes. will be on the cluster type. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, in this case, have you looked at, or do you know, I, I'm not aware of um, simulations, for instance, at high receive, because I would imagine this would suppress the formation of um, uh, quasars at high receive. Unless, no, it, it's, it's unless, very interesting. <coughs> uh, okay, sorry to jump in, because I, I literally uh, wanted to, to point out. So these clusters, uh, when they encounter, the main difference in their dynamics would be what is their environment, okay? Imagine that you're in the halo of, a, of a, <clears throat> far away from any dense uh, gaseous environment, then they still behave like clusters, okay? That means uh, black holes orbiting around each other. Now, if they are in dense um, uh, clusters with high, um, so a lot of hydrogen, like dense molecular clouds, typically the motion of these uh, black holes would uh, encounter a friction because of this gas. And there are simulations already of this. No? And typically what you have is rather than being orbiting around the central black hole in the cluster, they would just simply plunge in. So what you have is very soon, within a few hundred million years, those black holes which are forming the cluster, typically a cluster of 10 to the five solar masses with a central black hole of 10 to the three, all of those uh, black holes would form a very big massive 10 to the five solar mass black hole at the center. And this is the black hole, the intermediate mass black holes of 10 to the five solar masses that have been observed, by the way, already inside dense molecular clouds, which radiate in X-rays and the, through decays, you know, they go up to radio. So they shine in, in, in X-rays and radio. And there was the claim that this, uh, this radiation coming in radiant and X-rays came from the evolution of these uh, black holes, the intermediate mass black holes, from uh, being smaller to, to the level of 10 to the 5 or so, solar mass that has been observed. So these, uh, depending on the environment, again, uh, the dynamics of the black holes would be very different. And I envision that irrespective of this 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes, which directly act as seeds for the accretion disks around which quasars would form and galaxies would form later on, also, clusters of black holes of 10 to the 5 solar masses would also, in dense environments, would be seeds for 
uh, for these supermassive black holes at the center of gravity. Rather than quenching quasars, which is a phenomenon that happens much later, this would be the seeds for quasars. They would actually be the seeds because a dynamical evolution in, in, in gaseous environments is much faster than, than you have in, in, in black holes which are orbiting in, in vacuum. Very good, thanks. Okay. Okay, Juan. Th thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, I, let me just finish just insisting on and hoping that we'll have you here visiting our institute Looking forward along to this that, year. And just a very, very short question. You mentioned that sure. hopefully when you come here, let's say in summer, okay, there will be many new things coming in this field. <laughs> Which are the discoveries you think will be coming okay. in the next few months? Very good. Okay, I know that the, I'm not a member of LIGO Virgo yet. I have applied to become a member of Virgo, but I expect a, the second part of the third catalog, okay, this run of three B, which contains another 50 uh, events. This will have, sorry, another 30 or so, uh, 50 is the amount of uh, black holes, uh, would give us more information onto this uh, mass distribution of black holes. Mm -hmm. And these this new events, uh, I know of some which have uh, significantly low mass ratios. So I'm talking one in a hundred. And therefore opens the possibility, which I didn't have time to go, and I, I take the advantage uh, following Chema's uh, comment that I expand my answer um, uh, infinitely. Uh, of course, not infinitely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to describe uh, what happens when we have a large mass ratio. So imagine that now we're allowed to see, and we're sensitive to, uh, binaries that have, say, a 15 or 20 solar mass and 0.2 solar masses. So mass ratios of 100. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Then these black holes would tell you, th these black hole binaries eh, would tell you that its companion is not a star. It's a 0.2 solar mass, has a, such a tiny Einstein radius that the fiscal frequency, the frequency at which those black holes eh, mm -hmm. find each other and merge, eh, this fiscal frequency is eh, so large in, in frequency that still well within uh, the sensitivity because of the large mass of the uh, of the companion remember we're talking about 20 plus 0.2 22 so we're still in a hundred or so hertz eh, for the physical so we're inside this sensitivity eh? so we, we're not in deep in the quantum short noise however eh, we should be able to see those events and these are high mass ratios so they are in this new island for this we have to have the templates and i know at the moment they are generating the templates for such a small mass ratio so those that were analyzed in run one and two reached a q of one over 18 that's the smallest now of course we have to go to one over 100 so that means a significant amount of parameter space and this has been filled up as we speak and they are already uh, looking into uh, events of that of that nature because the the, the time stream is there and they're just looking at, at the possible uh, noise terms and, and trying to extract a signal from noise. So I expect from here to June, eh, when I visit you or, or after the summer, I do expect to have uh, events that would have uh, below solar mass a uh, black hole in them. This would be a tremendous revolution for, for, the, uh, for the whole uh, field. It's not just uh, for dark matter. It's, it's for the whole field, eh? finding black holes that would form in the early universe with below uh, the Chandra Seker limit is a tremendous thing. So yeah. it, when this, if this is confirmed, eh? I heard, but this is just rumors, don't take this. Uh, I guess this is uh, being recorded. Uh, so I'm very cautious. Uh, there are rumors of below solar mass eh? uh, events, but I, I have not seen those. I, I cannot claim them yet. Very good, Juan. But I mean, looking forward will, to those. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to it. Okay, bye bye. Thanks Thank a lot, and thanks to all the attendees to the to the. Thank you. Again. Thank bye you bye. very much, Anson, for the for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Uh, it was yeah. a pleasure for us. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Hope to take see care. you soon. Stay okay, safe. Take care. Thank you very bye bye. Much, Juan. Thank take you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hope to see you soon.